Hello, friends. Welcome to Saga Thursday, your weekly show all about the Saga Miniatures Game Universe. I am Raj, your host. Today, we're picking up where we left off with part two of our How to Play Saga second edition series. We've got two uh, demonstration warbands sitting out here. They're, these are four-point warbands each, so you can see the, the model counts vary. And we'll be using these guys to demonstrate some rules. Going to talk about the different troop types and some of the equipment options. And then after all is said and done, or maybe throughout, we're going to dive in a little bit more with some of the nuance of the battle boards. And hopefully at this point, when you're finished with this video, uh, combined with the last one, you'll have everything that you need to know to dive into this excellent game of Saga. So let's start off with the warriors here. So you might recognize these guys from the prior video, defending the onslaught against the Vikings. So warriors are the backbone of most forces, and warriors are the same in any faction of Saga. And it's going to be the same with uh, the Hearth Guard or the Levy or the Warlords. They're basically going to be have the same stat lines, and it's really the battle boards that kind of differentiate our forces here. So there's not a lot to remember in Saga, so that's pretty awesome. So once you memorize this stuff, you're good to go, and you won't ever have to go back to the rule book. And uh, so let's dig a little further into these warriors. So warriors uh, have one attack each, and they have an armor of four plus. Uh, one thing is if they are shooting, every two warriors will generate one attack uh, instead. So shooting, uh, you're going to see in Saga, that kind of follows a pattern. You don't quite get as many shooting attacks as you do close combat attacks. So those are your basic warriors. They are going to generate a Saga die uh, if you have at least four or more of them in a unit. So that's very handy. So yeah, most factions will have some warriors in there. We'll talk about the equipment a little later. Down here, we've got some levy troops. And these are your basic uh, <laughs> javelin guys. So most factions uh, will have access to some levy troops. And they're usually armed with a missile weapon of some kind, like these guys, either bows or javelins. But the base stats for these guys are, uh, they do have an armor of four, like the warriors, but they're not as good in close combat. So they actually, every three guys only generates a single attack die if they are armed with um, missile weapons, uh, as these, these fellas are. So this entire unit would only generate four attacks in close combat. So these guys aren't really good at close combat, not their thing. Uh, they do generate a Saga die, but you need at least a unit of six or more to do that. So you need even more of those guys than warriors. Um, and shooting, however, they every two guys will generate one attack dice, just like the warriors. So uh, they're, they're actually just as good at shooting as the warriors. And this entire unit then would generate six six shooting attacks. So they'd have more shots and shooting compared to the warriors, but uh, in close combat, they'd have like half as many attacks. So the levies are decent in numbers, good at shooting. They kind of have their place on the battlefield, and most armies could probably work in a unit or two. Some of the war bands might be more interested in uh, many <laughs> multiples of these guys, but we can talk about that a little later. So lastly, we have some hearth guard here, so you can see the Roman hearth guard are mounted, and that's not a particularly uh, specific thing with hearth guard, but these guys just happen to be. So hearth guard are really badass in close combat. They have two attacks each, and their armor is a five plus, so that is awesome. So they really dish out the damage. They uh, are hard to hit, and then they also. Uh, generate a Saga die no matter how many models are in the unit. So as long as there's one guy left, the unit will generate a Saga die. So that's pretty awesome. In shooting, each single Hearth Guard will generate a full attack die. So less than uh, the, the close combat, but they still are pretty decent with shooting. So let's talk about the Warlord next. So the Warlords are pretty badass fellas. They always generate a Saga dice on their own. 
They generate eight close combat attacks, so that is friggin' awesome. They will generate four shooting attacks. Um, most warlords don't have uh, missile weapons, but some of them do. Uh, and they'll throw four dice, that's pretty cool. And then their armor is a five plus in close combat, just like the hearth guard back there. So they're uh, very nasty fellas. Uh, but the best thing about them is they have a bunch of special rules as well to kind of really set them apart from your units of troops. So first off, they have determination, which basically means they can do one free activation on their own per turn. They can do whatever they want. It won't cost the Saga Dice. So that's pretty awesome. We have a rule called We Obey, which can activate a unit within short of them. So that's about four inches uh, to do whatever the heck they want. So... He's very efficient on the board while he's alive. He can basically count as two free activations, two free saga dice, basically. He has a rule called presence, which means he just counts as four guys um, for, for certain purposes. Most of the time, that's not going to come into play. Um, he has a rule called pride. If there's an enemy hero within range, he has to charge them if he's going to charge somebody. So, for example, set up here, um, if I activated my Warlord for a charge, uh, I would have to go in against the Viking Warlord over here. Uh, I wouldn't be able to charge the Warriors or Hearthguard over there because uh, of that pride ability. We have a rule called Bodyguards, which is pretty, pretty <laughs> handy here. So, basically, the Warlords just have one wound. They do have a rule called Resilience that we'll get into to kind of absorb some hits, but... Uh, basically, the bodyguards rule is a special rule that allows hearth guards within short distance of them to take hits on behalf of them. So if the warlord takes a wound, I can pass that on to a hearth guard that is within a short distance. So let's say that guy's just in, looking pretty close. So for whatever reason, if he suffered a wound, you could just remove a hearth guard instead. So... That's another reason to take hearth guards uh, to help keep your warlord alive. But uh, the does have the resilience rule, which can basically he can take a fatigue to absorb a hit in close combat. So um, it's kind of a interesting mechanic here, which we can get into here. So he has resilience one. So we'll activate these warriors. They're gonna go in. There's eight Viking warriors. They're going to get eight attacks against the warlord here. So another combat for us to see. Uh, they're going to be hitting on fives on my warlord. And we need a couple hits here. So we do get some. And then the warlord, of course, he'll get to attack back. He's going to hit on fours. Only three hits. Uh, the warriors will roll their defense dice, saving on fives. So they save two hits. So one warrior is going to bite the dust. And the warlord is going to be saving on fives. I need to fail a couple. So I failed both. So that is perfect. Uh, exactly what I wanted to show you. So the warlord has failed to save these hits. So he can uh, use his resilience rule to block the hits instead. So basically you can cancel a hit with a fatigue and with another fatigue. He can block the second one. Uh, so he takes two fatigue and he survives the combat. Um, but at the end of combat, we're both going to take an additional fatigue. And then the loser is going to retreat. I think in this distance, it would be the warlord for suffering two wounds. So he's going to pop over here. Uh, and then now he's exhausted. So that's kind of a problem. And this is when you need the hearth guards to... Uh, take take the hits for him because once you get to three fatigues you're exhausted and you can't actually take any more fatigues so if these guys had actually done three wounds for example he could have taken three fatigues and then the additional fatigue for fighting in close combat would just be shunted off basically you wouldn't take it because you're already maxed out now this is a really danger situation for the warlord because you can't take anymore so you're basically relying on these guys to take the wounds so very vulnerable position here for for my warlord after this close combat so that's how the resilience rule works and sometimes warlords can get resilience two or i suppose three 
But if you have that, basically you can block two wounds with a single fatigue. So that's a really awesome ability because if you took uh, four, four hits, for example, saved zero of them, took four, you could use two fatigues to cancel four wounds. So that's pretty... Pretty amazing if you can get it, but not not all the warlords can get it. So those are the basic rules for the warlords. Now let's get into some of the equipment options because we've got the different troop types, and then we've got the equipment options, which are basically uh, just creating our distinct units, which will go along with the battle boards to create our unique forces that we're going to use. So not every warband has access to every kind of equipment. And I, I like the Romans here because they pretty much almost across the board do get access to almost every piece of equipment that you can get. Where something like the Vikings, they're pretty bog standard fellas. They're not going to really get into uh, crossbows or necessarily even horses <laughs> are kind of advanced for their style of combat. So the other warbands, though, they do have access to all those equipment options. So we can talk a little bit about those options right now. So the first piece of kit that's fairly common in the Dark Age is the javelin. So most levies have javelins. A lot of times warriors, hearth guards, or even warlords could get javelins. So javelin is an interesting item here. It does a couple different things. So one is it reduces your armor in close combat by one just by having the javelins you're uh, you're like a lighter arm troop so you, you're going to take an armor penalty uh, in close combat so these levy were armor four base if you're shooting at them they will be hit on fours you can see these still got little tiny shields but the armor is going to go to three in close combat so uh, the javelin guys aren't great in close combat but um, well, maybe they are because they have an additional rule. Um, when they go into close combat, basically when they're charging, they get a plus one to their dice rolls to hit. Um, so it kind of cancels out their armor being lower because they're a little deadlier in close combat. So that represents throwing you know, the javelins in on the charge. And it's a pretty cool ability because sometimes... Saga abilities will uh, give you a bonus for hitting on a six or something like that, a six or more. And adding a plus one to your die is, is pretty pretty good because you can really juice up that ability. So pretty cool ability. Um, it is a shooting attack as well, obviously. So it can be activated with the shooting activation. Um, and you, the range is medium. And it follows the same kind of... Um, dice rules we, we talked about earlier. So we have a unit of levy here. If this was just a unit of six, every two of them would generate a dice. So six would generate three dice. So uh, you roll three attacks and probably get two hits right there. So that's uh, the one option. But the more common option is the javelins get a free shooting attack at the end of each move that they make. So these guys can make a move using a Saga Dice or another ability. And then they get a free shooting activation to kind of go and do their stuff here. So we'd have two shots, or two guys in range there, which would be one dice, um, and it misses because uh, warriors are armor four. So uh, that's kind of how, how javelins work. They can be used on horseback as well. Uh, very similar rules. And they're pretty, pretty handy little uh, pieces of kit if you can get them. Most levies do get them, like I say, and some of the uh, war bands, like the Irish, are, I think, the Welsh as well, and maybe uh, predominantly equipped with javelins, so uh, you're going to get used to <laughs> fighting those for sure. Uh, we talked about the bows last time. These will reduce your armor by one and th shooting and in close combat, but you do get a 12-inch range on your shots. So another piece of kit. There is another piece of uh, equipment, a crossbow, which uh, unfortunately I do not have a model of uh, crossbow fellas just yet. And the crossbows are pretty cool because they kind of work like bows. They reduce your armor in close combat and they shoot like bows, but 
when they attack, they get a plus one to hit. So if you're going to go against these warriors, for example, you would hit on threes instead of fours because they're so powerful. Uh, didn't matter for this particular dice roll. Um, so yeah, that's a crossbow. The crossbows are slow to shoot, so you can't activate them uh, just one after the other. You have to have some kind of uh, activation in between, which is kind of weird, kind of an advanced thing. But basically, if you shoot with a crossbow, you'd have to move or do something in between, do a charge, uh, and then you could shoot again. That kind of represents that it's kind of slow to shoot. Just another kind of restriction against shooting in the game of Saga, because we want it all about that close combat. Uh, over here, we've got some horses. So horses are pretty awesome in the game of Saga. They move a uh, big old 12 inches here, uh, and they can actually break it down into two medium moves if they are doing a movement. Uh, remember in Saga, everybody has to move straight. So these guys could move boosh, boosh, move around stuff. So very maneuverable. Uh, if they're doing a charge, though, they do have to go completely straight on the stick. So just keep that in mind. The horses do have a couple drawbacks. One is their armor is reduced against enemy shooting. So if you are have a good memory, these guys were armor 5 because they were hearth guards. So they actually have armor 4 against shooting. So mounted troops are weak against shooting. Uh, and then they also cannot go into the woods without uh, getting a little unhappy. So they can move into the woods, but uh, their movement is reduced to short like everybody else. Uh, and then they treat it as dangerous terrain. So if they move into a forest or rocky ground, they'll actually take a fatigue at the end of that movement. Um, so if they're going to charge somebody, for example, they would do their move. Take a fatigue and then you'd resolve the combat. So they don't like going into the forest, rocky ground, and they also don't benefit from cover while they are in the woods. So that is a thing to remember. I played a game this weekend and I forgot about that. So I was giving my opponent some extra cover saves for his cavalry uh, as they were coming in the woods to take out my Romans here. So uh, something to, to keep in mind. So you can also, if you are mounted, get access to composite bows which actually work more closely like javelins rather than bows. So their range is medium and they get a free shot. Um, it's a little, not quite identical to the way javelins work, but essentially you can get a free shot at the beginning or at the end of your move. It's a, like a free shooting activation uh, that kind of works like crossbows where you can take a free shot, but you have to move or do something else and then you could take another free shot. So uh, composite bows, crossbows, if you're using those, I recommend taking a look at the rule book just to really clarify uh, to yourself how those particular pieces of equipment work. So, so one thing I wanted to mention was there's also slings in this game of Saga here and they, they work just like bows uh, for, for the most part, uh, just bows by another name. Uh, the last piece of equipment I want to talk about is the awesome heavy weapons. So uh, Dane Axe is a type of heavy weapon. You could have some uh, knight types with big swords and whatnot. So in close combat, a heavy weapon does does hurt you. So you're not able to use your shield. So you're able, you have to reduce your armor by one, kind of similar to the javelins. But against shooting, you get your full armor. Uh, close combat though, it'll go down by one. So these are hearth guard right here. So normally there are fives. Again, shooting they'll be fives. But when they go into close combat, they'll be hit on fours. Now to make up for it, uh, just like the javelins, they get a plus one uh, to hit on their dice rolls. So that is a pretty handy ability. And unlike the javelins, they get it all the time, both when they charge and when they are charged. So these guys are always dealing it out. Unlike the javelins here, which are uh, kind of vulnerable in the opponent's turn because they take the armor penalty, but they don't get the plus one to hit. So that's basically all the equipment options. But I wanted to talk a little bit about your basic, your basic standard guys. So you're going to have lots of troops that are just spears and shields or uh, spears and <laughs> or, uh, swords and shields. So your basic troopers, they don't kind of get a, a bonus or anything. But they actually, they, they kind of do because 
they get an ability called close ranks that they can use at the start of combat and I kind of just stepped over it last time because uh, I didn't really want to get into it but close ranks is a pretty cool ability so it makes you a little more defensive and troops that have missile weapons uh, javelins bows or are mounted such as these fellows over here cannot close ranks so it's your, just your basic foot sluggers uh, the heavy weapon guys cannot close ranks so it's kind of a special ability for your basic troopers and the way that it works is if we're going to go into close combat you can have your attacks to gain uh, the ability to block on a 4 plus instead of a 5 plus for wounds that come in here so uh, why don't we uh, do some of that? So we're going to have these hearth guard are going to charge a unit of warriors here with uh, spears. I know they have them overhand here. I just like the way that they look. So those aren't javelins. Those are spears. So we'll bring these guys in. Going in straight as much as we can. And the hearth guard generate eight attack dice. And these warriors are scared. One of them was killed by the warlord over there, so there's only seven of them. And the very first step in combat is uh, do you want to close ranks or not? So this is option only for your basic guys. So the way it works is they're going to discard half their attack dice, uh, and they're going to round up. So that's a rule in Saga. You're always rounding up whenever you are doing something sometimes it'll help you uh, sometimes it'll hurt you as in this case so they're going to get rid of half of their attacks uh, but then they're going to be blocking on fours instead of fives so, yeah let's resolve the attacks here so we're not going to have any abilities or anything so the hearth guard are hitting these warriors on fours and half of them hit these warriors are hitting the hearth guard on fives. Got yeah, one hit. So the hearth guard are going to save on a five plus. They're going to block. They fail. So one of them is going to die. And then the warriors are going to take four hits. And unlike the hearth guard, who are saving on fives, the warriors, since they fought defensively, are going to save on fours. And look at that. So. <laughs> Since they fought defensively, they actually saved every single hit. If they weren't fighting defensively, they would have taken a wound. So these Hearth Guard are repulsed here. And they're going to fall back. They're going to move back as far as they can. So that was an example of fighting defensively. So everything being even, you're sacrificing your attacks to get a little defensive nudge. Now, if you can boost that up with Saga abilities, That'll be uh, extremely useful and very helpful. And if you, so it really relies on having some additional saga dice, but you can see sometimes uh, if you can just roll good, it'll, it'll come in handy uh, for sure. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about the army construction since we've gone over the troops and the various equipment options. So I told you that these were uh, four points each of uh, Saga soldiers sitting out here so yeah let's go over that so first things first is the warlords are always free so no matter how many points you're playing you're gonna get a free warlord model the hearth guard come four to a point so you're gonna specify how many points of Saga you're gonna play so you are play four points uh, let's say four points for this uh, arrangement right here. So you can buy a point of hearth guard, and that's four. Warriors are eight for a single point, and then levy are 12 for a single point. So you got one, two, three, four, your free warlord. And over here we have a unit of warriors, a unit of hearth guard, and then a bigger unit of hearth guard, so eight hearth guard, four hearth guard, eight warriors, so that's one point, one point, two points, and then the free warlord. So one thing you might have noticed was in the last game, that last video, I was using these guys as warriors 
And in this time, I'm using them as hearth guard in this warband here. So that's kind of a kind of a cool thing about Saga is there isn't really a set um, model types out there. You have historical models. There's plenty of manufacturers out there. So usually people use uh, hearth guard as guys with chainmail, and then they're warriors and levy without it. So you can kind of see it carries forward over here. These guys are a little more heavily armored. So usually that's how people represent their hearth guard is they're more heavily armored uh, compared to their regular warriors. So that's kind of how people separate those. Uh, but any, you could have different colored shields. As, as long as you can uh, make them distinct, there isn't really a hard and fast rule over what's a hearth guard model versus what's a warrior model versus what's a levy model. Now in the Gripping Beast ranges, they do have all those troop types kind of listed out there. But if you're buying plastics and sort of putting your stuff together, you can kind of get away with uh, using more of the heavily armored stuff for the hearth guard or using special shields or something like that. So and since we're kind of having a discussion about the models and stuff anyways, as far as bases goes, it's pretty, it's pretty wide open. There's some specific guidelines in the rule book about maximum sizes, minimum sizes, but you can see these guys are on 25s. These guys are on 20s. That's about as small as you can go. Uh, these guys are on a 25 by 45. And then you can see the warlords are usually on bigger bases. So even though he's a cab guy, he's on a suitably bigger base and to do kind of thematic stuff. So uh, those are the rules for bases. So one thing that you kind of need to wrap your head around in Saga is even though you're buying those troops in those 4, 8, and 12 increments, those are not what you have to use on the battlefield. So when you, um, so you greet your opponent ahead of time, what you're going to purchase for your four points, uh, X number of warriors, hearth guard, levy, but you actually don't have to specify their units or equipment until you're deploying them on the battlefield. So uh, this unit of levy right here, even though, you know, so I bought these 12 levies as one point, are more often going to be deployed as two units of six because six guys will generate a saga dice and then it's more versatile and more handy, I think, for the board. Um, the same thing with the warriors here. So we can get really crazy with the warriors because I have a few different model options. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, you can do it by equipment uh, as well. So I could have seven warriors in one unit and then nine in another unit, and that would be my two points of warriors. I could also have a unit of seven, a unit of five, and a unit of four. So there is a minimum unit size of four. So I could do three units of four levy, but they don't generate Saga die past, uh, well, they need six in a unit to generate the Saga die. So I wouldn't really recommend uh, doing three units of four, but it is possible. We're over here, we got a unit of four, a unit of five, a unit of seven, that adds up to 16, and it's Kind of a decent formation. We generate three Saga dies, but when we activate these units, we're not getting as much bang for our buck. Uh, we can't concentrate our uh, attacks as well as if we had a uh, bigger unit. So it's kind of a trade-off. you got to decide what you want to do with your battle board. And I think that's a good time to kind of get into the battle board. So a lot of the fun from a game of Saga comes from utilizing your battle board. At this time, we're going to quickly go through some examples of these saga abilities being used and then kind of show how they'll reflect in your army and uh, warband composition. So uh, just real quickly, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six units that meet the criteria for generating saga dice. So I'm going to roll these quick and I want to put some of these down here to show some interesting uh, activations. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Uh, something, something like that. Something like that will, will serve us well. So let's say we had a unit of levy. We're going to do a shooting activation at a unit of Viking Bondi here. And I've also loaded their board up. 
And so we can do three shots here, one for every two guys. After a shooting is declared, we count up our dice, and at this point we have the option to use fatigue and saga abilities. So the Vikings actually have this ability called Odin. It's a shooting reaction. So a shooting reaction means you can use it when you're being shot at. And the shooting unit takes as much fatigue as necessary for it to become exhausted. So it immediately takes three fatigues, and it could actually use those fatigues right now to weaken their shot. So normally they need fours. Uh, so if we spend a fatigue, it makes it fives, and spend a second one to make it sixes. So these guys now need a six to hit, and they didn't come close. So that's an example of a, quite a very cool saga ability from our Vikings here. Now let's say we've got our warriors. They're going to declare a charge on the uh, levy here. So we'll activate the bondy. Just going back and forth here. Uh, but there's an activation reaction ability on the last Romans board. It's called protect. Trigger this after enemy charge activation, so, but before it's resolved, choose the target of the charge. So if by popping this ability, we could have these warriors, uh, I could say I want them to go in against my hearth guard instead of my weak levy. So let's say we do that. So you can kind of see these saga abilities are quite fun. Add a little spice to the basic activations and stuff that we've been talking about. So we're going to get eight dice here on the Warriors. I think I gave them back that one guy that they lost already. Going against eight dice on our Hearth Guard over here. Or Hearth Guard. Some people don't like my pronunciation. Okay. So uh, the Hearth Guard don't have the option to close ranks. Uh, at this point, nobody has a fatigue. The Vikings can pop Uller, which is a melee ability. They can reroll all attack dice, which do not score a hit. So that's quite awesome. On the other side here, we have Disordering Volley. That we're going to have our Hearth Guard use. They're going to pop this to gain two defense dice. And it would go back to the Vikings. They don't have any other abilities that they can use, and there's no fatigue to use, so they're going to take a pass. And then we come back to the last Romans. We're also going to use this Frenzy ability. Inflict a fatigue on your unit to gain two attack and two defense dice. So you kind of see how this is changing our combats here. Uh, so the Vikings are going to be hitting uh, fives with rerolls, and I uh, just want to say that this ability prevents the Vikings from using that fatigue immediately. But uh, we should have ourselves a good combat here. I think it's stacked in the Hearth Guard's favor now, where it was kind of an even fight before. But let's see. These guys are looking for fives. And, oh, baby, look at that. With a reroll, they get two more. So six hits on the Hearth Guard. The Hearth Guard need fours on the Warriors. And a classic biff. So they only do four hits. So these are going to be the Viking block dice. They're looking for fives, block one. So they take three casualties. And the hearth guard takes six wounds, but they're going to add in four defense dice. So every five will save one. They save two. So of the six wounds they took, they save two. So four wounds. So these hearth guard are actually eliminated. Thanks to some good rolling and the power of the Uller ability outclassing the defensive abilities of the last Romans. So hopefully that quick little rundown gave you a good idea of the power of some of these Saga abilities. So when you're going over your battle board and kind of thinking about the units that you want to take, uh, you're going to take a look at these abilities. So going through the Roman board, see uh, activation reactions two of them we had the protect one which we talked about there's also a defense one that's similar but it works against shooting there's an ability here indirect fire it has units armed with bows so if i don't even have guys with bows i won't be able to use this ability period and if we look down we see 
two abilities that affect range weapons. So it kind of uh, is pushing you towards taking a combined arm style approach because up here is another ability that is Kantos, which is a mounted hearth guard unit only. So if you don't take mounted hearth guard, you can't even use that ability. So that's another uh, thing to consider when building your forces. So well, this isn't a super great ability, so I think you could get away without it. But a um, number of melee abilities that they have are, aren't too many. One, two, three on this board. And compare that to the Viking board, which has one, two, three, four, five, six melee abilities. And then this activation removes fatigue. So it kind of goes in with uh, melee and uh, similarly this Asgard ability. And then there's one shooting reaction. So sometimes the answer to shooting is having your own shooting units, or you can just have a really awesome uh, shooting reaction ability that you can use to uh, counter the shooting that you're up against. So uh, you can see how the Viking board is pushing you just towards regular troopers and kind of their army composition reflects that anyways. It's more reason to take warriors and hearth guard versus levy compared to the Romans where there's a lot of defensive abilities, a lot of uh, tricks where you can uh, change the opponent's angle of attack. So having a combined force is really helpful for the Romans. So that is uh, just something you kind of want to take a look at when you're building your warband. And we're getting pretty much to the end here, but there is one last thing that I, I wanted to mention, and that is the beauty of Saga and the units and models that you're building is they're often can be a multi multi-purpose so with the battle boards a lot of the flavor of your game is going to be dependent on these boards and you can actually use multiple boards without uh, too too much fuss typically so uh, the romans i don't think are a really great example of this because uh, these are kind of distinctive looking figures but these are the last romans from the age of viking supplement so this is the Roman board from the Age of Invasion supplement. So uh, this is more went, meant to represent the Western Romans, but it's, it's close enough. You could, I don't think anyone would have a problem if you wanted to mix it up and use this board, which plays very, very differently from this board. And similarly, with the Vikings, you have a ton of options, I, I think, if you have some Viking-looking guys. So... There's a Viking board and the Anglo-Danes board works very well and that's actually what these models were originally used as was Anglo-Danes. So these are the Vikings, the kind of first first couple generations that conquered bits of uh, England and settled down and now when the Vikings arrive they're fighting their old, uh, old brethren who kind of have uh, taken over as landlords and kind of mingled with the populace. So you can use them as Anglo-Danes. You can use them as Anglo-Saxons, which are the earlier uh, kind of Anglo forces that the initial Vikings fought. So this is kind of uh, going through different eras here, but I've also used this warband as Anglo-Saxons. And um, you could get away with using these guys kind of as Yams Vikings even, which are a Viking Brotherhood. So they got chain mail, they've got cool shields. They're, they're close enough you can use them for a lot of different factions. So the same thing with kind of poorer looking guys, the Welsh, the Irish, uh, potentially Scots perhaps, depending how you paint them. But you could kind of use those for multiple factions if you were so inclined. And similarly with the Normans, you could definitely use those as Carolingians, or if you wanted to push the timeline forward, you could use those guys as Crusaders. Um, obviously, they were part of the first generation of the Crusades. So, uh, yeah, just another cool thing about Saga that I don't think I've mentioned in any of these How to Play videos. And, uh, yeah, just trying to get the word out there about this wonderful game. So hopefully you've learned a lot. I've tried to go through as quickly as I could to give you the gist of everything and if you have any questions about stuff that isn't clear 
definitely post a comment below and I'll explain further. Um, but hopefully this will be a good introduction to the game of Saga. Thanks for watching. And I will have a video about terrain next week. I don't recall if I mentioned that in this video, but uh, there is terrain rules for Saga. And it's, the terrain video is not going to be specifically for beginners, but if you're a beginner, it's going to have everything you need to know about terrain in the game of Saga. So check back next week for that. Otherwise, we're wrapping this one up. Thanks, everybody, for watching, liking, subscribing. I'm going to catch you guys next time. Have a good one. Saga!